um, one of the speakers we have today, our featured speaker, is Mr. John Mattis, who is in the Education Department from the University of Maine. Um, he's a citizen scientist who has provided data for 13 years to environmental researchers at the University of Maine in Orno and to the Maine Audubon Society, who all the money um, from the fundraisers we've been doing this week is going towards. He was one of over 100 volunteers in the Very Important Pools Project, a study of amphibian breeding in vernal spring pools for nine years. He has been leading field trips to the vernal pools that he monitors for the seventh grade science classes at Orno Middle School. He also participates in Maine Audubon's annual Loom Pound Project. In addition, he schedules tours for schools and other groups of the Orno Bob Boardwalk and is an occasional tour completer when his schedule permits. He is employed at the University of Maine where he teaches classes for future and current teachers. Today he will describe his vernal pools research, some threats to amphibians and vernal pools, and some things people can help you to protect the environment. Without further ado, Mr. John Mattis. Christina said, my name is John Mattis. I'm a faculty member at the University of Maine in education, but that's not why I'm here today. Um, I'm here to share with you some work that I've done as a citizen scientist for the Maine Audubon Society. Um, this is a project uh, studying vernal pools. So, um, 14 years ago, uh, the uh, Audubon Society started a project investigating amphibian breeding in vernal pools. It was called the Very Important Pools Project. Uh, and we were monitoring the breeding of wood frogs, spotted salamanders, blue spotted salamanders, and fairy shrimp. Over 100 uh, people volunteered to be citizen scientists for this project. People from all different ages and walks of life uh, got involved in this statewide. Uh, each person had at least one pool, sometimes more than one, to monitor. Uh, Aram Calhoun, who is a faculty member at the University of Maine in Wetlands Ecology, uh, developed the data sheets, developed the training materials, uh, and we reported our results back to her um, for use with uh, Maine Audubon's advocacy on behalf of uh, the environment and particularly uh, the species that breathe in vernal pools. So here's a picture of a lost pond uh, in Orono, which is one of two pools that I've been monitoring since 1999. Um, this particular picture was taken about three weeks ago. And when I arrived at this pool after having monitored it for uh, previous 13 years, uh, my worst fears about what had happened this winter were confirmed. Um, it's not something that you can tell without a prior experience of this pool, but if any of you have been there uh, during the uh, spring, uh, you might recognize that the water level in this pool is way, way down from what it would normally be at this time of year. And that has important consequences for breeding amphibians. My wife took this picture uh, of uh, me, uh, doing data collection at the pool a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what I'm doing in this particular picture is measuring the depth of water in the deepest part of the pool. Um, in addition to uh, measuring water depth, uh, I do uh, air and water temperatures. Uh, and I look for breeding activity of vernal pool species, uh, as well as any other wildlife that might be inhabiting uh, that pool um, for any amounts of time. Um, so uh, what I'm doing here, you can see I'm leaning way over. Normally that would not be the case. Normally, just to give you some idea, uh, the water level would be up to uh, almost the, the tops of my waders. Okay? Gives you some idea relatively where we are here. 
Okay, so why does this matter? Well, it matters because this is a, a breeding environment for certain species of amphibians. In the center of this picture, uh, you can see a mass of wood frog eggs. Um, there are hundreds of eggs in this mass produced by one breeding pair uh, of wood frogs. Um, it takes about uh, three weeks for the, these eggs to hatch uh, into tadpoles and about another two months or two and a half months roughly uh, for the tadpoles to mature, to develop legs, to develop lungs, to be able to leave the pool and survive uh, outside of the, the water environment. That's just about how much time they have because this is a seasonal pool. It dries down uh, in the summer. Um, it goes down to um, uh, a pool that has no water at all in it. It's called Lost Pond because it disappears. Um, so it's very important that it have um, the water that it needs for these species to be able to breed here. Here's a close up uh, of the egg mass in my hand. Uh, you can see roughly how large this is and we're talking about literally hundreds of eggs in this one mass in my hand. Uh, you can see up against my little finger uh, individual eggs uh, and um, those black spots that you see are going to develop into um, tadpoles that are then going to leave those eggs uh, and grow and develop in this pool. Wood frog, uh, Latin name, Rana sylvatica. Uh, this is a creature that uh, is widespread over the northern part of the United States and southern Canada. Uh, it uh, begins its life as one of those eggs, uh, then turns into a tadpole, um, leaves the pool uh, as a juvenile wood frog, and spends the rest of its life in the woods around the pool um, a distance of anywhere up to 1,500 feet from the pool. Um, it only returns to the pool in the spring to lay its eggs and then it's back into the woods again. So unlike perhaps your other uh, ideas of what a frog is, that the frogs live permanently in a watery environment, these wood frogs do not, but they depend on these seasonal pools in order to survive. This uh, poster was prepared by uh, students at Orono Middle School as a service learning project. Um, each year I take the uh, seventh graders up to visit the two pools uh, that uh, I monitor that are uh, within walking distance of the school. Uh, and uh, in 2003-2004 and 2004-2005, the students in the seventh grade uh, researched vernal pools, developed the design for this poster, and if you go up there today, you can see this poster and see the information that they gathered. Uh, in the upper right, we have um, a wood frog. Lower right is a blue spotted salamander. Lower left, um, the spotted salamander, and in the upper left, uh, wood frog egg masses. So, we're going to do some audience participation here. Uh, and I'd like to pose this question for you. And you can see I've indicated on the slide five possible answers. So I'd like you to look at those five answers to the question, how do you feel about the mild winter we just had and the small amount of snow? We've got five options. I'd like you to pick one. And as I call them out, be ready to raise your hand. Um, and we'll just see where you all are uh, on this question, okay? So, ready to go? You got one of those five options in mind? Ready to raise your hands? Okay, so first of all, first possible answer. Great, I hate cold winters. Hands up. Okay, quite a few people. I'm pleased with the mild winter. Okay, maybe not so strongly, but okay with me, no problem. How many chose that option? 
Okay, very good, thank you. Hands down. How many are not sure how they feel about this past one? Okay, yeah, thank you. How many feel not so good? I kind of missed the snow. Oh, fair number of people on that group. Okay, maybe some skiers here perhaps? Mm-hmm, yeah, outdoor sports during the winter? Great. Okay, how many, I'm worried something's wrong. Yeah? Okay, let me show you why something's wrong. Okay, some of my data. Here's the maximum water depth in inches for Lost Pond in April over the last 14 years. Okay, you look at the, this image here, uh, you'll see that in most years, the maximum water depth is about 35 inches. Okay, a couple of years it's been lower than that. This year, look at the far right on this graph. Okay, the maximum water depth this year is 18 inches. Okay, half the normal. Now keep in mind, this is a pool in a shallow depression on a hill up behind Orono High School. Um, if the deepest point in the pool is 36 inches, that means the pool is full. If the deepest point in the pool is 18 inches, that mo means most of the pool has no water in it at all. Okay? So we're not talking about half the amount of water, we're talking about a lot less than half the amount of water. Okay? And that has consequences. Okay, let's look at some more data. These are the number of wood frog egg masses, not individual eggs, but egg masses, uh, from again 1999 until this year. And this year the breeding season's not over, so that last figure could certainly go up. Um, but you see there's a great deal of variability. We're talking about hundreds of egg masses in general. Uh, the peak year was 713 egg masses, um, but you see it's dropped off the last couple of years, and we'll see where it ends up uh, this year. Breeding success for us is defined as seeing um, the juvenile wood frogs leave the pool. And that happens in some years, it doesn't happen in other years. In 1999 and 2001, uh, we had droughts uh, in the state of Maine. This pool dried up in June. Um, there were thousands of dead uh, tadpoles on the bottom of the pool uh, when the pool dried up, okay? So if there's not enough water, remember what I said about the water this year, if there's not enough water, the wood frogs cannot breed there. There's going to be breeding failure. If that were to happen over a long enough period of time, it could wipe out the population. Okay? Fortunately for us, the drought years didn't continue. We had five years running where uh, wood frogs successfully um, emerged from Lost Pond. Uh, and those wood frogs became the um, breeding pairs for those peak years when we had over 700 egg masses, okay? Then we had four years when the pools didn't dry out completely, but for some reason that I still don't understand, I did not see uh, juvenile wood frogs leaving the pool. Was it predation? Did I just miss them? I don't know, but the drop off in the number of egg masses suggests that maybe there um, were fewer um, successful uh, juveniles leaving the pool, if any. Okay, uh, for this year, we'll see what happens, but frankly, unless we get a lot of rain, I'm not optimistic. Let's move from the local to the global. This is a graph of global mean temperatures worldwide, okay? Um, 
over the last 128 years from 1880 to 2008. And you'll see there's an upward trend here. Uh, probably can't see the, the uh, measurements in terms of degree centigrade is on the left-hand column, but I'll tell you the overall upward trend is about uh, one degree centigrade over a 128 year period. Uh, not quite two degrees Fahrenheit, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Not a lot, but notice that the upward trend seems to be accelerating over the last 30 years. This is what climate change scientists refer to when they talk about global warming. Climate change uh, scientists have made some predictions about what's likely to happen in the foreseeable future based on the data that they've been collecting um, all over the world, um, including um, things like uh, the uh, glacial uh, ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland and so on. We have some uh, climate change scientists at the University of Maine who have been traveling to those locations as well as to mountain glaciers uh, and trying to understand what has happened in the past and predict what might happen in the future. What they're predicting is that for Maine, as for the globe as a whole, we're likely to see warmer weather, shorter winters, less snow. Uh, it's likely to be wetter. Um, but when does that precipitation occur? That has a huge impact. We're likely to see more extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, but think about when hurricanes occur in terms of seasons of the year. It's summer into fall. So what does this mean for vernal pools like Lost Pond that depend on having water in the early spring going through uh, until early summer? Um, they're dependent on snowmelt and spring rains. If they don't get the snow, if they don't get the rainfall during that spring period, think about what that means for the breeding of the amphibians that use those pools. I'm going to take you on a little walk here, metaphorically, um, about five minutes down the hill uh, to the other pond that I monitor. This is Frog Pond. Uh, it is a pool that has a couple of additional sources of water besides snowmelt and rainfall. It gets water seepage off the hillside um, where uh, Lost Pond is located at the top of the hill and does not get that. Uh, and uh, it also gets uh, water seepage from the groundwater in the surrounding uh, wooded area. So Frog Pond uh, is capable of uh, supporting other breeding amphibians as well. Um, the name frog pond is a little ironic because it's referring to green frogs that don't breed there. Uh, but these are some of the animals that do. Uh, this is a tray full of uh, amphibians that have come to breed at this pool. Uh, there are wood frogs in this tray. The yellow spots come from a dozen or more spotted salamanders. And there are also blue spotted salamanders that appear in this picture um, as just uh, dark, um, close to black, uh, but they have very fine uh, blue spots as well. So all three of these species can breed in this pool because it has water longer into the summer. Um, the salamanders emerge in August rather than in July. This particular pool um, has experienced something that a lot of vernal pools uh, encounter. Uh, and that's the pressures of development. Um, this pool is on, on private property, um, specifically uh, an 11 acre parcel in uh, Orno, less than a mile from downtown. Um, the owners of that property in 2005 proposed dividing it up uh, into 11 house lots. Um, that would have taken up the entire 11 acres uh, and in all likelihood would have meant that um, the amphibians breeding in this pool uh, would uh, not have survived because of uh, development, uh, turning uh, wooded areas into uh, 
uh, people's lawns and gardens and what have you. Um, the solution to this uh, problem uh, of what to do about the vernal pool was to create a conservation easement, uh, basically a four acre parcel that will not be developed. Uh, that parcel is being managed by uh, a local uh, organization called the Orno Land Trust that does um, preservation of natural areas in Orno. Uh, there are land trusts all over the state and all over the nation that do the same task. Uh, so four acres are going into that conservation easement. The remaining acreage is being divided up into six house lots. The very important pool project has some specific outcomes in mind. Uh, they want uh, to collect data that would enable Maine Audubon to advocate on behalf of uh, the uh, vernal pools and uh, produce uh, several outcomes that hopefully will preserve vernal pools in the future. Uh, a set of recommended best practices for properties with vernal pools was developed. The state of Maine developed a legal definition of what I call significant vernal pools, um, those that have a large enough population uh, consistently over a period of time. Procedures were developed to review development projects near those significant vernal pools, and a variety of towns, including Orono, agreed to map the vernal pools within their town so that landowners would know uh, if they had a significant vernal pool. So those were all uh, actions that arose out of the data collection that I was involved in, along with over 100 other people trying to get a sense of where we were statewide uh, with those vernal pools. Um, there were specific consequences from that work um, that will have impacts for a long time in the future. All of this work to protect vernal pools in Maine takes place against the backdrop of a worldwide amphibian population decline. Uh, there are many species that have disappeared, uh, of frogs, toads, and salamanders. Uh, there are others that are threatened uh, for a variety of reasons that include habitat loss, human consumption, uh, disease, and climate change. So, time for some more audience participation. You ready? Question, what do you think declines in amphibian populations mean for humans? And again, you've got five choices. Um, let's take a look at these. Choose the one that uh, you uh, think best represents your position. And when I call it out, I'll be ready to raise your hands, okay? Everybody set? You've chosen one of the five options on the screen. Ready to go? Okay, so what do you think declines in amphibian populations mean for humans? First possibility, no worry, they're only frogs. Hands? Okay, thank you very much. You put your hands down. Okay, they're cute, but not really important. Hands? Okay, uh, maybe you're unsure what this all means? Yeah, you might want to research it some more? Okay, okay. You voted twice. Next option, the last option, there's a significant worry in the natural environment. What happens to that? Save the environment. What happens to them could happen to us, too. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I have one more audience participation question for you. What do you think on this one? Do humans have responsibilities for the well-being of other species? Okay, and uh, again, I've got five options to choose from. You know the routine. Let's go with it. 
How many hands up for no? We have to look at, out for ourselves first. Okay. Thank you. I don't think so. Are there more important things to do? Hands? Okay. Unsure? Yeah? Okay. Maybe you need to study up on this question before you take a position on it. That would be reasonable to do. I think so. We humans have the power. participating and answering these questions. Okay, I'd like to share with you some thoughts um, that have been shared with me from some friends who are members of Native American tribes here in Maine. Uh, as you may be aware, we have four Native American tribes in Maine, over 500 in the United States, not to mention tribes in Canada and uh, Latin America, uh, and there are significant differences among the tribes, but there seems to be some broad agreement about some basic beliefs that have to do with the relationship of humans to the environment, and I'd like to share these with you for your consideration. According to uh, beliefs of uh, many Native Americans, including some that I've talked with personally, humans are related to everything on the earth, and above the earth. We're related to animals, to the hills, to the moon. They're all our relations. And related to that, we should make decisions considering not just the short term or even our own life terms, but the future to the seventh generation, certainly beyond uh, when we would expect um, to be alive to think about that future and the, the, the people and the species and the earth um, going out um, beyond when we will be physically present here uh, as part of um, that world. Okay, if you believe, as I do, that we have a responsibility for other species, what can you do? Well, you could become an environmental scientist so inclined, I would uh, ask you to consider that some of the best environmental scientists in the world are just up the road at the University of Maine and Oregon. Um, so take that into consideration. Or you can do as I have and become a citizen scientist. You can contribute to the scientific research that's being conducted. Uh, whatever else you may be doing in your life, and all the data that I've got has basically come from Saturday mornings at the pool. Okay? Um, plenty of time to do other things and still be actively involved. You can be an active citizen, scientifically literate, informed, and aware. You can consider your personal lifestyles. You can become involved with community organizations to protect our environment. And you can engage with debates about environmental policies that our governments at all levels are adopting. Tate Kaufman, the executive director of Maine Audubon, has issued this invitation. Please join us in engaging in citizen science by collecting data for better decisions, advocating for environmental improvements, and introducing our children to the satisfactions and responsibilities found in nature. If you'd like more information, you can check out uh, these websites, among many others. Uh, Maine Audubon has nine citizen uh, science projects currently underway, um, and you can find out about them at the Maine Audubon website. Um, the Orono Land Trust, which has that conservation easement for Frog Pond, uh, has a website as well, and protects a lot of other um, sensitive environmental uh, areas of Orono. 
uh, and there's a Bangor Land Trust, and most other communities, many other communities have land trusts also. Uh, one of the very special natural areas that we have uh, very close to us is the Arnold Bog, access to the Bangor Forest. Uh, and if you're interested in that, we encourage you to take a walk on the Bog Walk, uh, check out their website, uh, and I'm the person who schedules school tours um, to uh, visit uh, the Orono Bog Boardwalk. If anyone here is interested in the tour, there are many other organizations, much to do. Thank you very much for your attention.